I think we're at the appointed hour and we can get started if, if uh, everybody's here. All right. Um, welcome to the November 18th, 2020 NIC Board of Trustees meeting. Um, we can start the meeting um, first by just calling to order. And uh, I wanna verify the quorum since we have um, two new trustees that haven't been sworn in yet and then three existing trustees, we do have uh, an appropriate quorum to conduct business. Um, in the Ken, past- I think the two new guys have been sworn in. I think Michael was sworn in on Monday and I believe Greg was sworn in this afternoon. Well, that's one of the things we're gonna do tonight also is to swear them in, so. Okay. Uh, but in Michael event, did it at my office. We signed all the paperwork, he and I both on Monday. Sure, okay. I think Chris has to administer an oath. Um, anyway, um, we'll do that tonight um, pro forma if for no, no other reason, um, just to make sure that it give everybody a chance to say hello and see their swearing in. Um, what I would like to do in the past, we've um, had the tradition of one of the trustees reading the mission statement to start the meeting and I'd like to continue that. And, uh, Todd, do you have that in front of you where you could uh, read the mission statement? Yeah, sure, I can do that. So the mission statement for North Idaho College is as follows. North Idaho College meets the diverse educational needs of students, employers, and the Northern Idaho communities it serves through a commitment to student success, educational excellence, community engagement, and lifelong learning. Great, thank you very much. Has everybody had an opportunity to review the minutes? And if so, are there any additions, corrections, or changes? Hearing none, uh, the minutes will be approved as presented. Uh, we've had nobody sign up for public comment. Um, and so uh, we'll move right on to celebrating success. Uh, and we have uh, Kai on behalf of the uh, ASNIC. Kai, are you, are you out there someplace? Mr. Chairman, this is Graydon. Yes. Graydon. And I'm certainly not Kai, but I want to note just a change to the uh, agenda tonight. Okay. Um, is that Kai's going to be presenting on behalf of ASNIC next month. And so we've asked tonight for the TRIO program that many of you are familiar with to make our presentation and celebration for good reason. They recently got some great news about the renewal of their grant. And I think many of you know what an outstanding job that they have done serving here. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Chris Green. Chris is the advisor and mentor coordinator for the TRIO program at North Idaho College. Holly Edwards, the director of the program, unfortunately is unable to join us here tonight. So Chris is uh, one of her staff members, part of a great team there that also includes Kim Summers and uh, uh, Becky and uh, other uh, mentors as well. Chris is joined tonight by Christine and Susie, who, Chris, uh, who are both students in the program, and Chris will introduce them. But if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to introduce to uh, you and to the trustees, uh, President McLennan, uh, colleagues and friends, Chris Green from the TRIO program. Chris, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank the board members for having us here today. Mr. President, thank you. Um, I will try to do justice for my director um, for our program. I'd like to just talk for a minute about the TRIO Student Support Services Program. I know that some of you are very familiar with our program, but for those of you who are not, I'd like to just review that TRIO is a federally funded program that began in the 1960s. Um, when the Pell Grant was created, uh, lawmakers knew this, that uh, students needed more than just funding. Um, those lawmakers just instinctively knew that students needed more support than just funding, um, especially those students from uh, low income, first generation households and students living with disabilities. Um, they needed extra support. And so uh, TRIO was created. And the goal of the TRIO Student Support Services Program is to help students stay in school and be successful and their courses to graduate and transfer on to earn a bachelor's degree. Since 2001, TRIO Student Support Services have worked to help students and to carry out the mission and to support the mission of North Idaho College. 
We track uh, academic persistence, uh, good standing, uh, graduation and transfer rates each year. I'm really proud of the work that we do um, in collaboration with some great collaboration partners across campus. This work that we do together, um, some of our success rates from 2018, 19, the most recent year that we have data, um, we had an 83% persistence rate and a 91% academic good standing rate and a 59% graduation rate, which I would note is about three times the national average. And so I think that's due to all of the tremendous support that we have across campus um, and that we are working together as a team to help students. Um, I'm proud to report that our college uh, received a new grant in August of this year for $1.47 million um, to fund our program over the next five years. Um, I'd like to speak for just a moment about how you qualify for services in TRIO student uh, support services. We, we um, students must first of all be a, a US citizen and they must be planning to go on to earn a bachelor's degree. And then they must meet one of three uh, qualifiers, be a low income student, uh, a first generation student, meaning neither parent has a bachelor's degree or a student with disabilities. Some of the services that we offer that really help to help students be successful is we offer a very personalized one-on-one -on -one, um, advising, uh, academic career and personal advising. We help students plan out and achieve personal goals. Uh, we work, we provide one on one and group tutoring, so we will pay for tutors to work with students privately um, up to two hours per week per subject. We also have a great mentoring program where we take students who are near the end of their pathway and have learned a lot of lessons and have a lot of life skills and we place them with new students that are just coming in that um, really need help to learn about the policies and the procedures and about how to get involved and act, stay actively involved on campus. We have um, a personal study coach that we place with students to kind of help them learn how to study smarter and not harder. Um, we have some great perks. We have involvement in club activities. We have a trio club. We uh, take students to vid visit college campuses like University of Idaho, Lewis Clark State College and others. We have a textbook sharing program that the students themselves run and give back to help other students. Um, we have a private computer lab for our students and with free printing. And we're just a, generally a cheering squad. Um, I'm really proud of the work that we do and I could talk to you probably all day about trios. I'm sure many of you have heard me do before, um, but I'd like to have one of our students. Um, we have Susie Elmore here with us today. And Susie has been a great force in TRIO. Uh, she came on and helped out in mentoring. She was our club secretary. She got involved in a lot of uh, extracurricular and off-campus activities to help the club. And she's been such a great student. She was recently recognized in the Coeur Press um, and she has graduated and transferred on to uh, Lewis Clark State College. So I'd like to introduce her. And then we also have Christina Haldi, who is one of my past mentors, uh, one of our mentors. I'm not sure if she's gonna be able to join us. She was having trouble, but uh, I'll go ahead and introduce Susie and let her tell you a little bit about her experience with TRIO. Susie. Hello, it's nice to get to the opportunity to speak to you all tonight about my experience with TRIO. I uh, kind of wrote a little list of the things and the ways that TRIO helped me because it was so much and there are so many different areas. Um, first of all- Christina, are you with us tonight? So I don't think Christina is able to join us. So I'll go ahead and wrap this up. Um, I was gonna close us out with, with her story, but I, I guess I'll just uh, share some of my own because I'm also a uh, former TRIO student, and that's the reason I'm still here. And it's easy to look at, we could pick all kinds of students and show all kinds of individual success. 
Um, but I think what gets lost in that individual story is the ripple effect that our students have in our community. So those numbers, 59% graduation rate, they don't tell the whole story. First generation low income students and students with disabilities, their actual uh, national graduation rates are appalling. They're about like 13%. They're extremely low. And uh, our students graduate higher than the national average. And yet our students, a lot of those populations, I also was one of those populations. And I gotta tell you, I've gone from being a first generation student to a first generation professional. And the way it's impacted me personally is, you know, the gold standard of a uh, high school diploma that not everybody got in my family has changed. Now my children believe that a high school education is just the start and that they're expected to go into college. Um, my son recently graduated from the Parker Technical Building and he's now in the Teamsters. Um, my family trajectory has changed and all of the individuals in my family moving on for generations to come are impacting our community and being a positive force for good. So I think the ripple effects that we have throughout individual students and their families and in our community is they're unable to, we're really unable to determine what those effects are, but they're, they're significant. And I can tell you from experience that they're real and that's why I'm here and I'm super proud to be a part of the TRIO program. So thank you for hearing us tonight. Chris, thank you very much. Uh, trustees, anyone have a question or comment to Chris or to Susie? Mr. Chair. Yes, Christy. Thank you. Um, well, I would just tell our new trustees that get used to this being your very favorite part of the board meetings. Um, when we get to hear from students and certainly our wonderful staff, uh, the impact that's really going on on the campus. And Susie, I don't know if you're still listening, but I just so connect to your story. And I am so thrilled for you, so proud of you, both both of you. And um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Any other comments? I'll say I enjoyed hearing your story too, and um, I'm happy for you. Great, thank you. Anyone else? I want to add something, if I might, before we go on to the next uh, agenda item, and that's that uh, Susie, listening to your story and listening about hearing about your success is pretty exciting. It really is. I, you, you show that excitement in the way you presented yourself, uh, and you have some a great future ahead of you, and I was really pleased to see the presentation that you made. It makes us all proud of what we do here at NIC because you make us proud, and I want to thank you. And Chris, the same thing goes for you. I mean, you've taken your, um, your start at NIC here and through the TRIO program to a great, uh, a great success in your own life. And I wanna thank you very much. Uh, you make us all proud, thank you. All right, having uh, a great celebrating success presentation, we'll now move on to the next uh, business. Special business, we have a canvas of the trustee election by uh, Chris Martin. And Chris, do I have it right that do you actually swear in the trustees then or? Uh, Chris, Howard, you're, you're correct. Um, we normally do that at this meeting. Because of Zoom, we actually met individually with each trustee and, and swore them in and had them sign their oath of office um, previously. Okay, well then we'll dispense with that tonight and we'll just have the canvas and then welcome the new trustees. So trustees for the canvas of the election, um, I, I'm happy to share with you the results and um, just need to read those in into the record uh, for the canvas of the, of the election. This election <clears throat> was held November 3rd, 2020. And for the North Idaho College District for zone three, Todd Banducci um, was elected here at unopposed with 62,417 votes. For the trustee for zone four, uh, Gregory McKenzie had 35,218 votes. Uh, Joe Dunlap had 29,543 votes. And for zone five, 
Michael H. Barnes, 38,834 votes. Paul Stern, 24,785 votes. Okay. Having completed the um, canvas and having already conducted the swearing in, we can now move on to the uh, next. Mr. Chair, yes. Mr. Chair, may we have discussion under this topic? Sure. Oh, thank you. Well, first, I'd like to welcome both of our trustees, our new trustees aboard. Congratulations. Um, <clears throat> campaigns are a lot of work. So good for you that you got through it to the end. And here we all are tonight. Um, before I continue on with my comments, I want to be very, very clear, very precise that in no way the comments I'm about to make, would I challenge the outcome of this election? I firmly believe it was a fair election. You all did a wonderful job. Um, full stop period. I'm not challenging anything, but I do want to bring to trustees attention, all of us, and, and maybe discuss guidance on how we move forward with this. Um, I was contacted by the former county clerk of elections and when he did his assessment of the election, he found an irregularity that I think it's worth us inquiring about only for the future, certainly not for the recent election. Um, that irregularity was the presence of 400, approximately 400 ballots that were blank. And his experience is there's usually, a, you know, somewhere around a dozen throughout the entire county where there are blank ballots. But these irregularities occurred in Legislative District 2 and the majority of them, specifically in that district, there were uh, Precinct 16, there is just a small precinct and there was over 130 what are termed overvotes, meaning a, somebody would have to walk in, say they voted, turn in a ballot and not mark a thing. That's normal for about a dozen or so, but when we're looking at about 400, Hello, how okay, I'm still talking. Um, when we're looking at 400 or so, um, there, there should be an explanation from Mr. Brennan's office on what possibly could have happened. Uh, a, a theory that he had, but that maybe it was just a software error. Frankly, there may be more votes for all three of our trustees out there than what they actually got. And I would like to ask Chris Martin to inquire with uh, Mr. Brand in the elections office and just see if we can get a reasonable explanation of why that discrepancy would have happened. Yeah, Christy, I, um, that may be something that, that should go on in a, as an agenda item and have the trustees uh, discuss it and decide what, uh, how to proceed. Your request is certainly reasonable, but um, if we're going to go move forward in the name of the trustees, then I think we ought to have it on, a, on the agenda item. That's perfectly acceptable. Thank you. Okay. Um, now we move on to the election of officers and Mr. Yeah. Alex, yes. I apologize for the interruption. I do need a motion to accept the canvas. Oh, all right. Um, so moved. So, did you make a motion to accept the canvas? Christy? I did, sir. Yes, sir. We need a second then? I'll second. Greg will second. Great. All right. Any, any discussion? All right. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. All right. Now we can move on to the, I think, election of officers. Um, we have uh, three officer positions. Um, President, um, or chairman rather, vice chair, and then we have secretary treasurer, which we have combined in the past. We could uh, do them as separate uh, offices if, if the um, trustees decide to do that. But in the past, we've had the secretary treasurer as one office. So I would entertain um, uh, nominations for the position of chair for the upcoming year. Mr. Chair. Yes, Christy. Yes. Christy, I can't hear you. You're, you're muted. I made a motion to nominate Greg McKenzie for chair. 
Okay. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it. Um, are there any other um, um, nominations for uh, president? Chair. Chair. <laughs> I, I would I would like to uh, um, nominate uh, Todd for that position. All right. And is there a second? Uh, Greg will second it. Great. All right. Any other nominations for uh, chair? Okay. Let's go ahead and vote on them. Um, all those in favor of Greg as chair, please signify by saying aye. I, I, Christy, did, I think I saw you move, but I didn't hear yeah. you. All right. All right. Aye. I'll, I'll vote in favor of Greg. Any, any more votes? Okay, we move on to the nomination of Todd. All in favor of Todd is? Aye. Chair? Aye. Aye. I'll vote in favor of Todd also. All right, so Todd is the new chair for the upcoming year. Now we have the position of vice chair. Now we're open to nominations. Yeah. Ken, it's Todd, if I may, sir? Yes, yes. I would like to nominate Greg for vice chair. All right, is there a second? Second. Also, okay, any other nominations for vice chair? All right, let's, uh, all those in favor of Greg as vice chair for the upcoming year. Aye. 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 Okay. Um, the last position is is the secretary treasurer, and we'll receive uh, nominations for that position. Well, somebody ought to do it. Uh, Christy, or I nominate Christy as uh, secretary and treasurer. That's Greg. Yep. I'll second that. Well. Any, yeah, you may you may not want it, but you got it anyway. Uh, any other nominations uh, for secretary treasurer? All, right. All in favor of Christy for secretary treasurer? Aye. 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 Okay, that concludes the election for the upcoming year. We have Todd as the chair. Greg is the vice chair and Christy is the secretary treasurer. At this time, what we normally do is since we now have a, um, a new um, slate of officers, um, the incoming chair it takes over the meeting. So Todd, the meeting is now yours. Thank you, sir. Looks to me like we're headed into the constituent reports and it looks like ASNIC will lead us off. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. Um, ASNIC has been very busy since the last Board of Trustees meeting. Thanks to the efforts of our Vice President, a Club Innovation Challenge was developed and put out. And this challenge was intended to inspire club leaders to think outside the box for how they engage with students in a virtual environment. And after all the applications came in, we selected the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Club, the GSA, and the English Club to win prizes for their club accounts. And the Aspiring Artists Club had an honorable mention award as well. In October, we held a candidate forum for the Board of Trustees election, which was very well attended, and began to, and began to apply some more strategic approaches for our projects. Earlier in this semester, one of our senators had sent out a survey for all students to answer, as I had mentioned in September's meeting. And we have spent the last few weeks going through the results and assessing the different areas of concern to see what we as a student government organization can do. Some of the areas that our senators are working on are outdoor seating on campus, 
adding more signs to make navigation on our campus easier, and concerns with the bookstore and promoting services we have like the food pantry, as well as taking a look into some concerns students are having with academics. We have also been meeting regularly with a marketing consultant to find the best way to reach our students and engage with them in a meaningful way that stands out and lets them know that we're here for them. And our marketing coordinator has actually developed a social media calendar. So if you have Facebook or Instagram, you can find us at ASMIC Student Government. So keep an eye out for that. For more club engagement, our vice president is working on the proposal for a club photo contest with three winners getting funds transferred to their club accounts. That will be announced next month and the deadline is in early February. Finally, we are working on designing masks to be distributed to the student body in the spring semester. And while the finer, the finer details are still being ironed out in terms of distribution and design. We hope to have that figured out very soon. And that is what I have for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions or comments for Kai? Uh, um, I don't hear any. Thank you so much for your report. Appreciate it. Next up on the agenda is Chris Pelchat with Faculty Assembly. Chair Banducci, fellow board members, President McLennan. Um, I'm here today as the chair of the faculty assembly. Um, I thought for the new uh, board members, I'd kind of give you a little rundown of what faculty assembly does. Um, the faculty assembly of North Idaho College provides a principal vehicle for faculty participation in the college governance system. Uh, we hold meetings once a month to discuss key items of interest to the faculty, as well as uh, use that time as an uh, informational session. Um, I act as the voice of the faculty at key leadership meetings and through the use of uh, assembly adopted resolutions presented to the board. I also ensure broad faculty involvement on college standing committees. Uh, and each month uh, for my report, I provide a rundown of key action items that were decided during faculty assembly, um, as well as kind of give you an overview of some of the information that was shared during that time. Uh, since the last board meeting, there's been two assembly meetings, and during our October assembly, uh, we had two key action items uh, that were discussed and, uh, and or voted on. The first one was uh, the appointment of our adjunct representative to the executive committee of faculty assembly, and that's going to be Nicole King. She teaches in the English uh, division. Uh, this is a new role for uh, the executive committee. Um, and it was instituted through the adoption of our amended constitution and bylaws that the board voted on in September. Uh, we also voted on a policy and procedure um, around uh, faculty evaluation. So whenever a policy and procedure is either amended or created and it uh, impacts faculty directly, uh, usually starts its vetting process in faculty assembly. And we take a look at it, provide any feedback and, and then vote on it. And then it goes from to there to the Senate and then to you all as trustees. And uh, the faculty evaluation policy and procedure had been in the works for some amendments uh, last year. And we spent uh, two assembly sessions uh, with a, a set amount of time discussing those amendments. Um, and some changes were made and we finally um, came to agreement on that and voted that through. So its next route is to head to Senate and then you will all see that shortly. During our November assembly, uh, we didn't have any action items. So it was more of an informational session. Uh, we heard from Randy Ware, Laura Godfrey and Gail Ballard about some of the initiatives that are going on uh, within the Student Learning Outcomes Assessment Group. Uh, I presented information about a new task force that I'm leading focused on enhancing retention through the intentional linking of experiences students encounter during their first year at NIC. We also heard from Kathleen Miller Green. She provided an update on advising services and the connection of their work to the role of faculty in the student advising process. And then we ended with a good of the order. And one of the things that came up was spring commencement and the commencement group encouraged 
faculty put on their thinking caps to come up with a creative solution to provide an in-person experience for students. Um, there was a lot of uh, passion around wanting to be able to watch their students walk across a stage. Um, and so faculty are going to start thinking about what can we do to, to make that happen. Uh, this concludes my report. Does the board have any questions for me? Well, Chris, it sounds like you've been very busy as, as ASNIC has been. I appreciate the uh, quick overview of your role. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments for Chris? Hey, Chris, this is Ken Howard. Um, hey, uh, your idea about having an in-person experience um, for the students next spring, summer, is a great idea. I'm wondering if we could use one of the football fields at one of the high schools to do an outdoor weather permitting graduation and spread everybody out. So I hope you come up with something. Yeah, that's, that's what folks are starting to talk about is how can we create space um, and maybe doing some parts of it virtually, but making sure that the students can be there and visually people can watch. Um, so we'll see what they come up with. I'm looking forward to hearing the bagpipes in the middle of the football field. So let's hope you come up with something. All right, I think that's, thank you very much, Chris. I think that's all the questions and comments we have. We'll head to staff assembly and, and Jeff Davis, and we go back a ways, don't we, Jeff? Indeed we do, <laughs> Coeur d'Alene High School. <laughs> Todd and I attended together. Uh, Chair Banducci, uh, trustees, President McClenning, members of the president's cabinet, colleagues and guests. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Davis. I am a student success advisor at North Idaho College. And I'm here acting in my role as the chair of the staff assembly. Staff assembly is essentially staff of North Idaho College. And as part of our system of, of shared oversight. Um, my, my job is to, very similar to uh, Chris's job, is to hear from the staff and coalesce and, and bring a common voice to our staff and, and to report to you as, as well as ask those questions that are, are most important to our staff. It, it gives us a great cohesiveness and it gives us a great uh, opportunity to voice uh, not only our opinions, but our concerns. Uh, we meet every month. It, it tends to be a pretty jocular affair. <laughs> and, and we also, talk about uh, the serious issues facing the staff. Uh, so we met in October as usual. There's the usual housekeeping. Uh, we do something called Sterling Silver, which I hope you're all aware. And, uh, and if not, uh, find out about it. We celebrate somebody every month and um, and make sure that they are recognized for their excellent work. Uh, in October, it was Maya Lackey, the Senior Administrative Assistant at Parker Tech. We also do shout outs. Um, we won't go over all of them. All I can tell you is that basically it's, it's a time for one employee to shout out about another employee and to say, what a great job they're doing. In the past, before COVID, it could be slim. Now we have, uh, we make our way through, in some cases, 10 plus shout outs. COVID has brought our team together uh, like nothing ever has before. In October, we also had a, a time when our employees could post anonymous questions to the staff of human resources with their concerns about what might be going on with COVID, with 
the working place, how, uh, how things are run and how we could be both working from home and working uh, on site and, and keeping everyone safe. And I have to say our human resources department rose to the occasion and did an amazing job of answering everyone's questions. And the, the questions were pre-submitted, so they were able to think about them thoughtfully and, and really supply some excellent answers to some of our questions, which uh, made a world of difference uh, to our employees. And they've uh, actually compiled all the questions and the answers, and we're going to be putting them out to, uh, to the general populace uh, and help them feel like they're more connected to the college and, and that they, they do indeed have a voice and they're being listened to. Uh, in our latest meeting, uh, in November, we uh, had another Sterling Silver Award winner, uh, Heather Pickles, who has been with, with the college for quite a while. Uh, she works in the copy center and, and, the, and the mail area, delivering uh, all the things we need uh, physically around the campus. And so we're very, very happy that she was able to get this honor. Uh, shout outs, tremendous amount of them, and it was wonderful. Um, we also have reports. There's, there's housekeeping to do so that we're all informed. And uh, we do have the NIC Foundation uh, Awards Ceremony coming up in which uh, there are uh, staff and faculty uh, divisions that are awarded grants in order to, to purchase the things they need to do the, the great work that they do. Um, and of course, a thank you to our veterans. And our guest speaker spotlight came at the end, which is not very common. Uh, it was uh, from Kathy Albin, who runs our Center for New Directions. Uh, I won't go into a great deal of detail uh, about what her, her work is, but it's about getting people that feel marginalized in a lot of cases or are returning to the workforce and honestly don't know how to navigate college and help them navigate college and get the things that they need. And we're also connected to local charities who not only at Christmas, but hopefully and potentially throughout the year, students can get what they need to succeed. She's connected personally with so many students across the campus and out at Parker Technical where um, they are hanging by a thread, but they are doing everything they can to stay in school so that they can advance themselves and their families. And it was quite emotional. And we had uh, a lovely time hearing her stories. And uh, that is the end of my report. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate that. A lot of information. You guys are also quite busy. Appreciate your quick overview on your role. Does anybody have any questions or comments for Jeff? Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Now we come to the Senate. Uh, Steve Kurtz, please. Thank you, Chair Banducci. Uh, good evening, uh, trustees, Dr. McLennan, colleagues, students, and guests. Uh, just similar to what Chris Pelchett did with a little introduction, I uh, have just information about what the, the Senate is about. And is it possible I can share my screen? One second, Steve. Thanks. Sorry about that, Shannon. No problem. You should be good.
So hope you can see that. Uh, I lifted a, a sentence from the Consti NIC Senate Constitution. The Senate is charged to act for and represent its constituent groups in matters of college policy and procedures. Typically, a policy is looked at, um, uh, created, or revised uh, many different ways. It can start off as an ad hoc group, and then it's vetted typically through staff assembly or faculty assembly. Eventually, the college senate gets involved towards the end of the process, and any changes to policy, any new policy and procedure then is forwarded to Dr. McClendon for his formal presentation to the Board of Trustees. There's officers. We have a chair, vice chair, parliamentarian, corresponding secretary, and past chair. The staff and faculty rotate the chairship each year. So next year, Mac, Max Mendez will take over. And those senators appointed by, uh, elected by their constituency groups, then caucus and pick the vice chair for next year. So next year, we'll have a staff member as vice chair. There are eight faculty senators elected by their peers, eight staff senators elected by their peers, and four student senators that we're working with this year. We meet once a month, typically, eight times a year, and we have our typical uh, agenda items that are customary approval of minutes. We present updates from each of the respective uh, groups, uh, each meet in, or important meetings, such as the Board of Trustees, the Presidential Advisory Committee, and right now we have a subcommittee that is reviewing board policy over seven years and in, in matching the accreditation cycle. Uh, we're trying to at least touch each policy and, and uh, clean it up or update it so that we're prepared for our next accreditation visit. We meet tomorrow and under new business, uh, I'm sorry, under old business, each policy is read twice before formal uh, uh, adoption by the Senate. Uh, the, the bar is very high. Uh, the senators take their responsibilities very seriously. And uh, we have two policies, 3.09 evaluation of administrators policy and procedure and 3.0222 employee development policy and procedure for a second reading. That used to be the staff performance appraisals uh, policy. And then under new business, if we have time, because we only have 15 minutes, sometimes we don't have enough time to devote to each agenda item, but we'll do our best. But we have a bereavement leave policy, and I believe that hasn't been looked at for quite a while. So we're looking forward to reviewing Joe's changes and passing it on to uh, Dr. McClendon for his review. That's all I have. Are there any questions? Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. Are there any questions or comments for Steve? Steve, again, thank you also for giving us an overview of the role of the Senate and, and the composition of it. I think that was very helpful and appreciate your report tonight. Thank you so much. You're welcome, sir. We now come to the president's report. Uh, Rick, if you would, please, sir. Thank you, uh, Chair Banducci. I have a short, brief report <clears throat> this evening, but first I wanna add my congratulations to the new uh, trustees, welcome aboard. Um, I also want to extend my appreciation for everybody who participated in the workshop last week. I, uh, you know, North Idaho College is, uh, uh, it's a complex organization. There's a lot of moving parts. You just got a little bit of a preview on some of the governance structure through the constituent groups. Um, and so I know that that orientation really just marked the beginning of a, of a, a learning journey that uh, you're going to be on. And, and we're all here uh, to welcome you and to help be a part of that uh, journey with you. So more to follow on that. Um, uh, let's see, there are two groups that I work with external to the college. One is the President's Leadership Council, and uh, that's the group comprised of the eight public college and university presidents in Idaho. And um, and the other is called you, uh, Trustee Howard mentioned last week, the ICCC, which is the Idaho Community College Consortium. Both of those groups have been active um, over the summer, this last spring, actually, on uh, two issues in particular that uh, may have some legislative interest uh, or activity for us this year. And one is uh, the funding formula for higher education. I don't have a lot of detail to present on that right now. Uh, that work is in progress. Um, 
know, there may be some advocacy. Greg, this is Michael. We got some other. I really want to hear what you have to say there, but there's some other noise coming in. I guess it got taken care. Of. I'm sorry, Rick. Okay. Am I okay to go? Yeah, I, th yeah, I sounds, think. I think it, yeah, it sounds like it's gone. Please continue, Rick. Okay. Um, so there, there, what I was, I think what I was about to say is there may be some advocacy work to do on that. We will be, we're, we're gearing up for the legislative session. This is a time of year that we began doing that. Normally we would be, uh, we will participate, but we would actually host a legislative reception for our North uh, Idaho delegation. It's going to be a little hard to do that this year. Uh, so I will be uh, scheduling one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, meetings with each member of the North Idaho legislative de the delegation to um, reacquaint them with North Idaho College is part of what I try to do and, and make, you know, make sure they understand our mission, especially if they're a new representative, uh, but also to make them aware of some issues for higher education that uh, will impact. Um, are you still having a hard time, Michael? Yeah, there's an open mic somewhere that's I keep coming in. I don't know who has I'm control not, of it. I'm not hearing anything anywhere. I wonder Dan, if and can you mute everybody? Yeah, I'll try to. Um, I'm not sure where it's coming from. It seems to be coming from you, Rick. I don't know. Todd, I'm going to mute you if you don't no mind. Noise. There's no noise here. Oh, that might explain it, depending on where your mic is. If you've got moving paper, that's what it sounded it sound like paper moving across a microphone. Oh, that could be. I was hearing somebody either shuffling paper or moving something around. Okay. Well, this is embarrassing because I think that was me. Let me continue. Uh, so anyway, we'll be setting up those one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings um, here uh, throughout the fall. The other legislative issue that may come up is uh, uh, the uh, tuition cap for community colleges. Community colleges differ from the four-year institutions in that the state board sets tuition uh, for the four-year institutions. Uh, the locally elected trustees set tuition for the community colleges. Um, Chris went, did a little overview of the three-legged funding stool last, last week at the Orientation Center with state support, local tax dollars, and tuition. Uh, we're about $2.70 something cents away from uh, the statutory cap that was set 43 years ago, uh, and it has not been revisited since. So. Um, this may not be the year to do it, but there's an interest uh, for all three of the four community colleges are at that cap. And it's, you know, especially in a year uh, where we effectively lost 7% of our state support, having access to that other lever is going to be important. Uh, it's not a lever that gets pulled um, uh, injudiciously or often. Uh, in the last two years, we've had 0% tuition increase the year prior, we had a one and a half percent increase. So just to put that in perspective, but it does give the board flexibility in terms of uh, institutional support and sustainability. Um, again, I'm not sure how far that's gonna go this session. We're still working out the strategy for that, uh, but I'll have more information on that as we get later into the uh, fall. Uh, I received a note from Matt Freeman today. Matt Freeman is the executive director of the State Board of Education, uh, and he is uh, wanting to get the presidents together. And the only reason I mentioned that here is that he uh, and, and he mentioned three subjects. Uh, one of them was the uh, JFAC, uh, which is the Joint Finance um, Committee uh, for the Legislature and Education Week that happens in January. And the other thing, without any explanation, was trustee. Uh, training. And so I don't know what he has in mind for that, but uh, again, I'll have more information on that when I when I get that. Uh, next, I just want to mention COVID-19 and our uh, ongoing response to that. Uh, COVID uh, keeps us in a very uh, uh, dynamic environment. Uh, it has from the beginning, and that hasn't changed, especially with the rising numbers in our, in our region. Uh, and uh, I did forward a copy of the letter that I sent to the campus, uh, to the college community, to uh, both the city trustees and the trustees elect uh, last week. I think that gives you a fairly good idea of where we are operationally, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions about that. Um, we're now really taking a hard look at uh, spring and a possible adjustment of the spring opening. We have not made a decision on that yet. Uh, 
So more to follow on that as well. And then lastly, I just want to commend, it's on the agenda tonight, the action for the board to accept the NIC annual uh, financial audit. And uh, I want to commend uh, uh, Vice President Martin and his staff, uh, Sarah Garcia, who's on the screen with us this evening, uh, for the consistent, sustained work that they have done uh, uh, with our fiscal oversight of the college. And it's represented uh, in, the, in the audit. And also, as you know, in one of the five accreditation reaffirmation accommodations that the college received on our um, um, fiscal stewardship uh, and, and institutional sustainability. So I just want to make sure uh, that uh, you get that recognition by me. I know you'll probably get it from others tonight, but I want to let you know how much I appreciate that. That concludes my report. I'm happy to try to answer any questions you might have, and I'll not shuffle any paper while I do it. Thank you very much for your report, Rick. I would like to second my uh, appreciation for the work that Chris and Sarah have done. I had the privilege of sitting through the audit pre-brief on Monday, and we are, we're doing a very fine job at this college and uh, the auditors confirmed that. So uh, kudos to all the folks that have been doing their job so well. Are there any questions or comments for Rick on his report from anybody? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Um, I have a question, but basically to the president. Um, the um, Do you know when the next ICCC meeting is? That would be something that uh, Todd would attend and sometimes, and we've talked about in the past, also having the vice chair attend one or two of those meetings in order to become acquainted with the, the work of the ICCC meeting. Do you know when the next meeting is? I believe we have that. We set it purposely post-election. Uh, I believe it's somewhere in early December, but I actually I don't know if we've actually set a date for it yet. We're not traveling, so uh, there's a little more flexibility there, but um, uh, I'll certainly... Shen, you don't know, do you? Yes, it's December 4th. Okay. That will be by Zoom. Okay, I'll get that on the calendar. Uh, yeah, let's, let's explore that. That might be a good chance to, uh, for Greg to be involved and, and uh, be nice to have a, a, a backup for all those sorts of things. Um, you know, along that same lines, honestly, I talked with uh, Steve Masterson and, and uh, depending on how this all played out, we had discussed the idea of maybe the chair and the, and the vice chair both working with the foundation. So uh, I think he was going to propose that to the appropriate people on his end. And, so I'm hopeful that Greg will assist me in being the liaison with the uh, with the foundation board and, and working with those good folks. I think he and I each bring some different skill sets and, and talents that uh, will help us better serve the college and work with those good folks. So I, never hurts to have a, a good backup. Greg has a question. You bet, go ahead. Uh, regarding the North Idaho delegation, um, I take it that's an ongoing kind of yearly relationships. Keep uh, like, is that a yearly thing, or is this kind of like a? It's been long enough. Just doing it again. Um, we try. I, I try to do something at least annually. There's it, it really it the the depth of that really depends on what's happening uh, specifically with legislative interest or. Uh, you know, until recently, uh, I mentioned JFAC and Education Week. Well, until the, up until about three years ago, uh, colleges uh, submitted what are called, what are known as line item requests uh, for program expansion or special needs, institutional needs that were not funded through the regular um, funding mechanism. And uh, dependent, we've had years where we've had uh, upwards of a million dollars of request in line item request that we would need some our, our local delegation and others throughout the state to understand what the, those things were and their impact on North Idaho College and why we needed their support. So there might be more uh, dialogue and ongoing sort of education or information, you know, going back and forth in a year like that. But just generally, um, there's an annual outreach to 
prior to them uh, going into the session, ask just an, you know, communication. Uh, here's what's happening at North Idaho College. What questions do you have? Here are our interests from workforce development, CTE, career and technical education, and other interests or priorities that the institution might have that we need their support for, or at least ask their support for. Excellent. Thank you. I have a All question. Right, oh, you bet. Go ahead. Um, Todd, are, I'm just trying to clarify what you just said. Are you suggesting that you are going to serve as a liaison to the foundation? Or are you saying that Greg is going to? No, I, I'm suggesting that I will assume the traditional role as liaison as board chair, but that Greg will also work with me uh, with the foundation also. So instead of having just one liaison, we would have two. And and if I'm unable to I attend, see. it would be Greg or vice versa. If he's unable to attend, it would just be me. But for the moment, I, I was going to propose that maybe we, we both work with the foundation together. Um, so that, that was my that was my thought. But I've, Steve and I have talked about what that. We, oh, sorry. I, what I, I just said, Steve and I, is I, oh. <laughs> go, go ahead, Christy. Um, what I will do, Todd, is then I, I will just reach out to you for a private conversation. And your next uh, agenda item is the K-Tech report. And while we're on that subject of filling positions, I we don't really have that listed on the agenda, but it would make sense that we discuss that again tonight too. Thank you. Certainly. And Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Ken. Um, with regard to the foundation, um, traditionally what's been done is that the chair would appoint somebody to be our representative on the foundation. I mean, I did it when Christy was chair. Um, I had somebody else do it part of the time when I was chair. Um, and the foundation has a position for the chair or for the re for a representative from the trustees, but it's a non-voting position and it's one position. Um, so I don't know um, how that's going to work into your your suggestion, but just so you know that uh, at least the positions that have been um, uh, created by the foundation, I think, is one position for uh, the trustees. Well, and that's why I'm not saying anything's a done deal, but I spent over two hours with Steve on Monday, and we discussed a number of things. Uh, one of those was this possibility of doing this, and I know he's going to go back and talk to his people and, and see what they think about it. So uh, nothing's a done deal here. We need to see what their position is, but uh, it seemed favorable and kind of a more the merrier on this one and uh, for us all to work together. So, so we'll see what the, how the foundation responds. Um, that decision hasn't, hasn't been made yet. Uh, I, just, I just mentioned it as something that's been discussed. Thank you. Now, uh, I guess it's K-Tech, so I guess that's me, unless there's any other questions for Rick. So I'll give that quick briefing. We had a meeting in October uh, on, the, no, on, on the same day that our meeting would, it would have been, had it been held. Uh, just a couple quick things. Enrollment currently at that time was at 402. So over 400, that's a very impressive number. Uh, lost a few, but not many in the current, considering the current environment. Uh, classes are full. Of course, we're far enough in this semester, as you might expect, there are no wait lists, but classes are quite full. So they're, they're very pleased and enrollment's looking good, uh, projecting for the spring semester. Um, they did have kind of a unique uh, circumstance arise. The National Guard uh, I believe it's three different schools have been selected. We're one of them where they gave us essentially a stripped down Humvee. And I think they get the spring semester to do something with that. So it's basically uh, three schools were given the Humvee and it's a competition to see what you can do with this stripped down Humvee and what you, what you produce with that. So and again, that was from the national guard. So uh, quite unique, quite interesting. And I think they uh, the folks are quite excited about that because they'll, They'll be incorporating a number of the different classes and disciplines as a part of that project. 
Um, you know, as you can imagine, all the different folks that would be involved with you, you were given basically a frame and told to produce a, a, an operational vehicle. So uh, they, were, they were looking forward to that project for the spring semester, a little real life hands on. And that's probably all I have for KTAC. Um, so, Christy, what were your thoughts on? Did you have a specific thought on KTEC or anything? I mean, I, I'm happy to keep doing it. I love it. But, I mean, if someone else is, is dying for it, I know we're going to have some other things where people can uh, be assigned to be a part of. Probably somebody needs to continue to be the liaison for the Meyer Health and Science building expansion project. And then I'm not quite sure what else we have on the horizon that someone might find in their wheelhouse to want to be engaged with. Is there um, anything else that I'm missing? Yes, I, I would suggest, um, actually, it's the board that assigns the KTEC representative. It's not um, just the board chair. And certainly. so we certainly talk about it as a group. And I would open it up to all trustees. Um, Todd, I think that it's probably not appropriate as chair that you would serve in that position as well. Not that you okay. haven't done a good job. You have. You've been doing it, I think, three years now. And um, so I would strongly suggest that that gets opened up to other trustees and a trustee steps up. Okay. Does anybody have an interest in doing this? Actually, I do. Is this Michael? This is Michael. Okay. Great. Well, tell us, Michael, what are you thinking, partner? I'm thinking that I'm very interested in, in KTEC and, and what it's doing and how is it serving our community. Um, so. Okay. Now, now, just for you to know, it's, it's not a very onerous schedule. We usually have meetings about every other month or so, and it's a noon meeting. Often it coincides on the same date that we have our board meeting. It's usually about an hour, about a noon to one approximately. Um, there's a little bit outside time, a little bit of, materials they'll send you but it's not a it's not a huge time commitment it's as much as you want it to be you know as active as you want to be and as engaged as you want to be out there with, with the school and and uh, with the parker center uh, so you know you can kind of determine you know if, if you haven't had the opportunity already one of the first things you'd want to do is get out there with colby uh Mattia, the director and and get a tour and and uh and and all that sort of thing and spend a little time familiarizing yourself out there probably absolutely it sounds great Mr. Um, Chair, any, Mr. Mr. Anybody, Chair. Yes, sir. Would you like to nominate? I, I would like to nominate Michael to be the um, liaison to KTEC. I think that sounds great. Ken, anybody want to second that? I will second that. Okay. Uh, any other discussion before we vote? Greg, any comment? No comment. Sounds good. Okay. All those in favor, would you please say aye? Aye. 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 Are there any nays? It sounds like it was unanimous. Michael, you're the new liaison for KTEC, sir. And I'd be happy to tell you what little I know to get you started. I know you will. <laughs> um, I do have a, some material and a notebook and a few things I'd be happy to pass on to you and, and to share with you, my friend. So we'll, we'll do that on the side. Fantastic. Thank you. You're very welcome. Congratulations. You'll enjoy it. It's a it's a fantastic group of people to work with. Uh, it's been extremely enjoyable for me. Yeah. Okay, um, I think that wraps that up. So we we have a, a new K Tech liaison. I've given my report. Were there any questions on my report? Did anybody have any questions on that? By the way. Okay, I don't hear any. They're they're doing great. I will say one thing that is happening a little bit there. Uh, kind of a PS. I think they're starting to look at their numbers and the and the and the budgets and all the rest of that. And in the same vein that the that the three school districts are kind of starting to scrutinize and starting to think about the next semester and just going forward and levies and bonds and just all the way it's going to look going forward. I, I think KTEC's feeling a little bit of that pressure too, as the school districts feel the pressure. You know, the I think we could always use some more support from the state for the career technical. And I'm sure KTEC could use some more of that too. So there may be some interesting decisions in the near future. And I think one of the challenges is how do you promote funding for KTEC because it's all rolled up inside the school district. So it's hard to really advocate for KTEC in and of itself. So it'd be interesting to see how, how they choose to do that in the future. 
All right. Um, on the agenda, it says that we have no old business. So I'm going to move forward to the new business. It would be tab three. It is an action item. Uh, we will vote to accept or to not accept uh, the NIC financial audit for year ending June 30, 2020. We have a couple of folks on the line. I think we have Barry and Jody. Am I correct on that? Correct. All right. Um, whoever's ready, why don't you guys uh, lead off and, and give us your presentation, please. Thank you. I thought it first, Chris, did you want to say anything to start? Sorry, Chris, didn't mean to overlook you. No, no problem. Uh, uh, Chair Banducci, members, members of the board, um, it's it's our pleasure tonight to come before you with the the audited financials for the college for the year ended June 30th, 2020. Um, we did have a chance to have an exit conference um, with, with our team from Ide Bailey earlier this week, and Chair Banducci was in attendance. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to, to Jody and Barry. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, trustees. Uh, my name is Jody Doherty, and I am the audit partner on this engagement. And with me tonight is Barry Weber, who is the uh, manager on this engagement. Um, we want to start by saying thank you to Chris and Sarah and their whole team. I mean, they're they're a great team anyway, but this year presented additional challenges with the um, audit being completely remote, <laughs> which um, for them to be able to have everything done. And I think we were out a week earlier than we had been in the past too. So on top of that, um, they had everything ready. They had to upload everything for us. Um, the student financial aid office, kudos to them too, because of all the students we have to look through and all the documents for testing student financial aid, they had to upload all of that for us. So um, great effort by um, that whole team um, to get ready and um, have the audit be as successful as it was despite having to be done 100% remotely. So thank you um, to all of them. So uh, I'm going to talk quickly about um, the Ide Bailey letters that you'll be getting, and then Barry's going to get into some highlights from the financial statements themselves. So I want to talk about a letter that will be coming to the board from us um, when we issue the final financial statements. And this letter is our way of communicating with the board um, some of the items that um, we want to bring to your attention. Um, if we had issues, if there were findings, if there were significant misstatements, you know, stuff like that, this, is, this would be how we would communicate it with the board. So some of the things I want to highlight um, in the letter, it talks about our responsibility in the engagement and it's to um, give you a reasonable assurance, but not absolute, that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. Um, we do let you know that we are independent from North Idaho College. There were no significant accounting policy changes this year, so nothing to note in the financials. We do like to bring to your attention that within your financial statements, there's some pretty significant estimates and Barry will talk a little bit more about this, but the estimates related to the college's share of the Percy pension liability and the other post-employment benefits, which um, has to do with the um, health care that is provided to your employees and to retirees. So those are just estimates, they do change and fluctuate um, from year to year. So we just make you aware of that. Um, and then again, if we had any difficulties or anything that we needed to communicate with you, we would do it in this letter. Um, we had no difficulties. We didn't have any misstatements and um, not really any significant matters that we needed to bring to your attention. So you will be seeing that letter come out when we issue the final financial statements. Um, also in the financial statements, the report that Ide Bailey owns is on the first couple of pages. And in that auditor's report is where we give our opinion that the final financial statements that you have that are part of your board packets um, are pr fairly presented in accordance with GAAP as of June 30, 2020 and 2019. Um, within the financial statements, there's also a few schedules that are called the required supplementary information that are required by the standard setter. There are GAP, but, but are not um, re required by GASB, but not necessarily a part of the financial statements. 
and that is the management discussion analysis and then those supporting schedules for that those other post employment benefits in the Percy pension that I mentioned. So with, with these statements, we do look at them and uh, we make sure there's nothing in them that is wrong, but we do not give an opinion on them. Also in the financial statements is the uh, schedule of revenue and expenditures, your budget to actual uh, and the schedules of debt service. Uh, we give a, an opinion that's in relation to the financials, which means that as we are auditing the financial statements, um, we do look at these schedules and compare them to the underlying um, financial, the trial balance as we're looking at them and doing the financial statements. So we do give an in relation to opinion on those schedules. So that's what's in our auditor's report. Um, I think Barry is the next slide financial. Yep, okay, so I will now turn it over to Barry to um, talk about some of the financial highlights. Thanks, Jody. Um, can everyone see the screen, I'm assuming, still? Perfect. Uh, so before I kind of lead off here, I'm going to cover some basic financial highlights. Uh, these are all on the financials. These are kind of summarized versions to kind of help you see year over year balances. Um, I do want to note as part of this that uh, there are two other entities that are what are called component units with the college. One is the Dormitory Housing Commission, the DHC, and the other is the Foundation. And there's kind of a complex uh, GASB analysis we go through to determine how to treat those two entities and how they relate to the college. The, the way that that kind of shakes out is that the foundation financials are presented along with these. So if you were to flip through the 71 pages, you'll see the foundation financials, financial data within there presented separately um, because that information is valuable to the reader. The Dormitory Housing Commission is consolidated within the college's financials. So this financial data we're going to talk about does include the DHC, um, in particular, the debt and the capital assets associated. And that's just due to the close relationship and kind of there's a checklist that, that we go through to determine uh, that that would need to be consolidated. So that is the way these have always been presented. I just wanted to, to point that out before we lead off. So we've got 2018, 2019, 2020 data here for what is effectively the balance sheet, the statement of net position. You can see from an asset standpoint, uh, it's been growing the last several years, uh, the current portion as well, the cash investments, investments being the LGIP pool, the local government investment pool. Uh, so that has been growing the last couple of years. Uh, receivables, most of that student tuition, grant receivables, those kind of things have stayed fairly consistent, slight growth there as well. Uh, there is a portion of restricted cash and that restriction is mainly due to the bonds. There's a portion of cash that has to be set aside uh, to make those upcoming bond payments. Uh, you can see the capital assets have grown quite a bit this year, almost $9 million increase. So that's gonna be your property, your buildings, equipment, those kind of things. Uh, about a $9 million increase this year. That's, that's due to $12 million of additions offset by about $3 million of depreciation. And I'll show you a little more detail about that shortly, just given how large that account is. Uh, the last item here on the asset side, the Percy sick leave and DOR. And that's what Jody touched on before, the pension system, liabilities and assets, and how that works. So what the state does is they kind of come up with this big estimate of Percy sick leave, the pension system, the other post-employment benefits, and they allocate a portion of that to the college. And they say, your portion is a fraction of a percent of this big pool. And so that really is just an estimate based on actuarial data of you know, how long people are gonna live, what the investment return is gonna be, what those future payouts, and there's a long list of actuarial data that goes along with that. So while this is gonna show up as an asset for the sick leave portion and a liability down here for the pension portion, it is important to remember that those aren't current assets, current liabilities where you're gonna be able to use them to pay bills or you, you aren't gonna have them come up and ask for an $8 million check to pay the, this liability. That's all a function of that pension system. You're gonna make your normal pension payments for each employee. What this is effectively saying is if the pension system were to shut down today, how would this shake out over the next 50 years as those trail out, you make payments to anyone that retires, those kind of things. So it is somewhat of a funny number, not 
a true asset or anything you can put your hands on. Um, so it is an estimate just to keep that in mind. So that's the $5.2 million here. That's the benefit, the, the quote unquote asset, the liability down here for 8.6 million. Uh, we do have about $5.3 million of current liabilities. That's been pretty consistent. That's your accounts payable, your accrued payroll, all the upcoming bills for the college. The bonds payable, 8.4 million. You can see it's been decreasing as we've made payments on that the last few years. That's the portion that's the DHC. And we'll, I'll show you the, uh, the footnote here shortly that kind of breaks that down. And then compensated absences, that's gonna be your uh, accrued, um, accrued leave for staff and faculty. At the bottom here is your net position. And, and the easy way to kind of identify that is your equity, your net worth. Um, it's a little different because you might have capital assets that are worth more than what they're showing here, but we don't fair value anything. So for book purposes, your net worth is about $90 million. About 66 million of that is already invested in those capital assets. So that's the 75 minus the debt. So that's not money you can use to pay payroll. You can't use it to pay your upcoming payments. We've got about 6.8 million that's restricted. A lot of that is restricted for capital assets, cash that's been given via grants or donations or, or what have you that is earmarked for additional capital assets in the future. So your true unrestricted equity to be used to pay upcoming bills is this $16.9 million number down at the bottom. And I, I did kind of break this out just to see the, the net per C OPEB impact. So that's gonna be the 5.2 minus the 8.6. So what this represents is kind of what, it, what your balance sheet has decreased due to this per C estimate. So of $90 million, if I were to remove Percy and not put it on your balance sheet, it would be $3.4 million better than that because this is kind of an estimate and it fluctuates significantly year over year. You can see it has actually been decreasing the last couple of years, a lot of that due to strong investment returns. And feel free to chime in with any questions as we go. Um, I'm happy to answer those. On the profit and loss side, statement of activities, we've got our operating revenue up top. We've got student tuition growing slightly the last couple of years. Grants and contracts, you can see a pretty significant increase this year, about a million dollars, a little over a million dollars. And that's gonna be due to the CARES funds, the Higher Education Relief Funds, HERF funds. There was about 1.1 million that was granted to be used for students and then was distributed back to the students. Uh, and then a slight decrease in other revenue as those auxiliary activities that were um, shut down last year. And so we'll have that decrease in up the revenue as well as a decrease, offsetting decrease in operating expenses as uh, if my understanding is right, we moved that to a third party, I believe. Uh, operating expenses also very consistent that significant increase. Uh, right yep. now to offer to um, answer questions as we go. Yes, absolutely. Let me go throw ahead. that one, throw this sure. one out. Go ahead, Michael. You, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just because it just pops out of my head, I see so from 2018 to 2020, there's an increase in student tuition. Um, how does that balance with the understanding that there's been a decrease in enrollment over the years? Or has there been an increase in enrollment over the past two years? So that's gonna consist of a couple of things. It's gonna be student tuition and fees. Um, and I think we have seen a slight increase in overall fees. Uh, I believe there has been a small increase in tuition rates since 2018. I don't think it has been that significant. Um, and then it would be offset by the allowance that the, the portion that the college pays. Um, so this wouldn't necessarily be the gross number. This would be the net of the portion that the, 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 fine, the um, scholarship allowance that the, the college is covering. So it's going to have a lot of different pieces impacted there. Um, I'd have to break it out to see what the gross amounts are there um, and see what the trends look like. But I do believe that there has been a, a little bit of a decrease in the scholarship allowance the last couple of years. Okay, thank you very much. And Chris, feel free to chime in with more. Yeah, one, one other comment on that to be aware of is there was a, a rather significant increase in the dual credit tuition that's um, actually paid for by the state. Um, this last year. So that, that was a substantial change. It was a $10 increase for dual credit uh, per, per credit that we can charge. So that's the, another factor there. Okay, so and Chris, this, this is Todd. Oh, sorry. 
as I say, as these questions come up, please just go ahead and answer them. Don't don't wait for me to cue you in, okay, buddy? Just go 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 ahead and answer all the questions. Okay, so uh, if no other questions on the, the revenue side, uh, operating expenses also had about a $1.3 million increase. Most of that is those HERF funds. So that's kind of an in, in and out. We get about $1.1 million of student aid and then disperse it. So we're going to see that increase on both the revenue side as well as the operating expense side. So that's kind of why that increased. Uh, we do show the operating loss, and, and that's just required of in the statements itself as if this were a quote unquote business and didn't receive any state appropriations, property taxes, additional grants, et cetera. Um, but in this bottom section, you have your non-operating revenue. So that's gonna be your state appropriations and property taxes, which have remained relatively consistent in total, uh, slight decrease in state appropriations, slight increase in property taxes. Grants and contracts also relatively consistent. That's gonna be a lot of the student financial aid um, the Pell Grants, the all the different, the trio, all those kind of things are going to be within that total. Private gifts as well. Most of that's the foundation, um, foundation gifts each year, a little bit of other income, and then a big increase this year, a uh, new item, capital contributions. So that's mostly going to be uh, donations from the Department of Public Works for the construction of the DeArmond and Boswell buildings. So those were uh, construction that were funded by the Department of Public Works. So they went directly into capital assets. Uh, the cash never actually flowed through North Idaho College. So change in net position, that's going to be your quote unquote net income. Uh, which obviously was very strong this year. However, knowing that $8 million of that 10.6 is um, really just an increase in the value of a building as the construction is, is happening. Any other questions on the statement of activities? So I uh, just touched on a couple of financial highlights here as well. And, and at uh, the suggestion of um, Trustee Van Ducci is that we kind of open this up so that you guys can actually see the, the financials themselves rather than me just referencing them and you having to find them. So I will touch on just a couple of the key disclosures um, as you kind of flip through the financials, you can see um, what those key disclosures look like. So. On page 15 here, we've got the actual financial statements of the college. So 14 and 15 are gonna be your balance sheet, what we covered, we covered the, the summary data. Um, this would just break it out in a little more detail. Page 16 is gonna be your profit and loss, the statement of activity, statement of net position, changes in net position. And then on page 21 down here is the foundation statements that I touched on earlier. And I'll just sit right there just for a second. Uh, and again, this is just required disclosure. They're what's, what's called a discreetly presented component unit. And that just means that we're gonna present their financial data separate. Uh, they are audited by a, a separate auditor. Moss Adams performs their audit. We just include their data within here um, because it's useful to the reader. So obviously, you know, from an asset standpoint, they're gonna be mostly investments in cash and then, you know, pretty minimal liabilities. And most of that, um, equity being designated for the college's benefit that they'll pass on eventually and get investment gains off of that. And they have, they do have their own separate financials as well uh, that you could see in more detail. And then the, they've got their statement of activities, their profit and loss for 2019 and 20. Key data being bottom line net income last year about 174. And then in 2019 was about 2 million. As we scroll down into the footnotes themselves, I'll highlight just a couple of key ones. Note two is gonna be your summary of your cash and investments. And this is what I touched on earlier with most of the investments, quote unquote, being within the local government investment pool. So you can see relatively low risk is where the funds are being held over 2020 and 2019 here. And I'll just sit there just for a moment here, just so we can absorb. Well, while everybody's absorbing it, just a little context, 
the actual report is 71 pages. So as I was going through it with the Zoom with these folks, as I was thumbing through and trying to reference uh, the different pages and everything after having reviewed it previously, we thought it would be helpful just to show some of the pages because not everybody would have all the reference material available to them or, or the reports themselves. So, so we thought we'd try to give a little more information as, as uh, these guys as it was being briefed tonight. Note three is going to be what I touched on earlier, which is the capital asset side. So that's going to be the property, equipment, buildings. On the far left Barry, tier column. I... Oh, yep. Sorry. No. I thought I was unmuted. Um, not very quick on the draw here. I wanted to ask a question on the last um, last page with the investments. Can you go back to that? Absolutely. Um, I don't quite see it yet. But it's, it was one of my questions that I was going to ask of Chris, but you can answer it as well. Um, the local government investment pool, can you explain who participates in that? Chris, did you wanna take this or I can take it? It's up to you. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, local government investment pool is gonna be, uh, it's, it's unique to each state. So this would be the Idaho local government investment pool. And that's gonna be any governmental entities in the state of Idaho that wanna participate. So it is a pool and you, North Idaho College has a, has a percentage of that pool an allocation of that pool as a whole. So North Idaho College itself doesn't hold any specific assets, specific money markets, anything like that. They just have a small portion of the pool itself. Um, and it does return a small yield each year. I want to say last year was about one and a half percent off the top of my head, uh, maybe two percent. So it, it is a relatively safe investment opportunity uh, when you have that extra cash. I, I would say probably, and, and Jody, feel free to chime in, but I'd say probably 90 percent of uh, the, the governments we work with have funds in the LGAP, maybe more. Um, so it's, it's very, very common. Thank you. And, and it is treated as cash. You can see here it's cash and cash equivalents uh, because of the turn rate of it, that it is effectively, you can withdraw and put money in at any time. There's a lot of different factors there, but it is treated as cash equivalents in this case. So while it does have investment in the name, it isn't really an investment for financial statement purposes. <clears throat> Capital assets, uh, you know, I touched on this earlier, obviously big, big dollars here. We've got the 2019 numbers in the far left here, uh, additions, transfers, disposals, and then the new balance on the far right. So you can see these are the net values that we noted earlier, about a $9 million increase. And most of that is gonna be that building addition from the Department of Public Works to the DeArmond and Boswell. I think it was about 7 million to DeArmond and about a million to Boswell. And that's gonna be most of the addition, a little bit of other additions, land, ground improvements, furniture and equipment, offset by the depreciation that'll decrease that value. Any questions on the capital assets? Next one I'll just touch on is the debt footnote. And I'll go to the summary here. A little bit. So this is gonna be the changes in debt year over year and where that debt is located. So we do have those compensated absences that I touched on earlier. Those are a long-term liability to be used in future years. The primary two debt sources are the 2012 revenue bonds and the 2016 revenue bonds. The 2012 revenue bonds continue to be paid down. I think those have two years left, 2022, those will be done. And I, I believe it's set up at that point that the 2016 payments will kick in or shortly thereafter. Barry, could I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, the revenue bonds that you're referring to, those are revenue bonds with the st student uh, housing authority. Is that correct? Not, not with NIC directly. Correct, that is gonna be the DHC. Um, and then they do have uh, the revenue that is generated uh, along with those housing um, sources is pledged to pay those principal payments. So the idea being they are generating uh, their own payments to pay for these. 
Thank you. A couple other notes I'll just touch on. Note seven, eight, and nine. If you're ever looking for some light reading, I wouldn't recommend these. Uh, it's going to be the pension disclosures. So it's about 12, 13 pages of actuarial data, um, breaking down all the different assumptions they used, how they came up with their estimates. This is done at the state level. Uh, Milliman actuarial valuation does that valuation, comes up with those estimates um, of what those liabilities, those deferred outflow and inflow of resources, kind of quasi assets and liabilities. And that's about 12 pages of data. If you're ever looking to understand that, um, feel free to flip through those. I won't, uh, I won't spend too much time covering them as we've already covered the, the key numbers themselves. There are three, there's three pieces of that. There's the pension itself, uh, the sick leave, which is the asset because it's actually overfunded right now. Um, and, and that's the other post-employment benefit is the sick leave. And then there's a uh, other post-employment benefit that the college has itself, that's self-funded. So those are kind of the three pieces of that. Notes 12 and 13 I'll touch on as well. Those are gonna be the component units. So it's just disclosing key financial data for those component units being the Dormitory Housing Commission, as well as the foundation. The Dormitory Housing Commission, again, is, is consolidated in here. This is just the breakout. If we were to separate it, what the impact on the profit and loss on the, the income would be. And so this would be that, that key data for them, operating revenue that they're generating, which is pledged to cover those debt service payments. Zoom in here just for building expenses, their income from operations, and then obviously they have those debt service payments that they have to make. Um, again, Barry, could you, several years ago, we had an issue with whether or not the booster club should be uh, included as a component unit. And I don't know what the test is for that, but could you discuss whether or not you looked at whether or not the booster club should be a component unit? We did actually, we have a, we have a, a memo um, that analyzes each one of these three, the three being the foundation, the dormitory housing commission and the booster club. And it, what it does is it kind of goes through a checklist that's required by GAP uh, that said what the, what the relation between the entities is, what the transactions between the entities, uh, influence they have over each other, those kind of items. Uh, and so it, for these three entities, uh, it actually comes to three different conclusions. One being the booster club not being in, um, presented at all as a component unit, the foundation being presented as a separate component unit, and the DHC being presented consolidated within the primary statements. Thank you. Note 13 is going to be that summary data for the foundation. So the primary financials up above, uh, this would be any additional uh, disclosures that they have within their financials, key disclosures that are also included in here. So how their investments are allocated, uh, what their investment income is, is generating each year, those kind of things. And that covers most of the key disclosures within the financials. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. On that side, um, I'm always available. So if you have questions after the fact, uh, feel free to reach out to Chris or Sarah. I'm sure they could put you in contact and I'm happy to give more information. Uh, transitioning to kind of the next piece here is we always like to cover what's different this year, what changed from both the financial statement side as well as the audit itself. So the big change is obviously CARES, uh, the impact of COVID um, and then that additional funding coming through. So that additional funding will need to be audited. It's what's called a single audit because it's a, it's a federal award that's being expended. The problem we've had is that uh, the Department of Education has not come out with the compliance supplement for that yet. Uh, and that compliance supplement effectively lists all of the requirements, how to spend the funds, how to manage the funds, all of those. And so that's what we use to audit. We match up what NIC has done to those requirements to make sure they're following the requirements. Uh, they haven't come out with that yet. So we actually haven't been able to complete the single audit yet. It is a separate audit than the financial statements. It's a separate opinion that's issued, uh, but that has not been released yet. So because of that, 
The financial statements typically, so if you were to look at last year's financials, you would see that both the financial audit as well as the single audit, they have been included in the same report. Again, two separate opinions, one's on page two to four, one's at the very end, the single audit report being at the very end. Uh, this year that won't happen because we'll, we'll issue these financial statements, assuming they're, they're approved by the board, we'll issue these. Uh, and then we'll just have a separate document that will be the single audit itself, the audit of the federal awards being student financial aid and any other large federal programs, including the HERF, higher education funds. So there is gonna be a slight change to the report. Uh, you'll see in prior years on our primary audit report, we do reference those schedules Again, we don't give an opinion on the financial statements, but we do reference them. Uh, and those obviously those references will go away because this is gonna be a completely separate um, uh, document this year, not gonna be included in the same document. Along with that separate document that we're gonna issue this year uh, goes our report on internal control over financial reporting and compliance with government auditing standards. And there's a couple of pieces here, the big one being internal controls. So we do procedures related to internal controls. We do what's called a test of design. So we analyze the design of the different processes that the college has. So who approves uh, purchase orders? Who signs checks? What's the process for depositing cash and approving tuition rates and all those things. And so what we'll do is we'll test the design and we might test one or two transactions we don't do a full test of the details. So we don't, while a, a public audit and SEC audit might do a hundred tests and select a hundred items to test and analyze. Uh, we just test the design of the control. But as part of that, we do issue an opinion that says, uh, we had, have not noted any material weaknesses. So if we came in and said, you don't have a process for who approves purchase orders, that might be a material weakness. So as part of that, um, obviously, we haven't issued that report yet, but we have not noted any material weaknesses as part of our test. So a clean internal control report is effectively what you will see uh, probably in January when that full single audit document is, is done and audited and reported. On the single audit side, uh, we have done as much work as we can do up until now. That included a single audit performed over the student financial aid cluster, uh, which is required to be audited every year, as well as the aging cluster. And we're happy to report that there are up until now, uh, there have been no findings. So we will obviously have a, a full opinion in that other document. Up until now, we have not seen any findings, no internal control issues, um, no compliance issues, any of that. So thus far on the single audit side, uh, it is a clean report. Again, once the uh, HERF compliance supplement will finish that uh, audit and then probably issue, I would say probably in January, we still haven't received the report. It was supposed to be in mid-November. Um, I'd probably put my money on December at this point. This is just a summary of what that schedule of expenditures of federal awards will show. So again, this is much of that, that revenue, those expenses are gonna be included in those financial statements up above. This would be a separate document, a separate audit that uh, looks at controls and compliance. Are we spending the money the way we're supposed to be spending it? Uh, those kind of things is what this separate audit would be. So this is just a summary of where those funds are coming from. You can see the vast majority is gonna be that student financial aid cluster that we audited, uh, as well as the HERF, 1.4 million in total, 1.1 being the student portion, the remaining being the institutional portion. And then we, uh, we did audit the aging cluster as well. Head Start was audited in 2018 and it will be audited next year. It's audited once every three years. Barry, this is Ken Howard again. Could you go back to the previous slide? Absolutely. Um, my question is uh, the part where you, you say at the bottom there, there's no assurance that material weaknesses do not exist that were not identified. That um, just sounds very awkward to me, but when you say there's no assurance, that sounds like you can't tell us whether or not there are material weaknesses. Correct, and, and that touches on that type of internal control opinion that we give. So it, it, what it says is we, are, we did not note any material weaknesses as part of our audit. 
So it, it's, it's not providing an opinion on your internal control structure. We only look at the design and testing a certain number of transactions. Um, and so it's, it's kind of noting similar to our financial statement um, audit report that notes we provide reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance. So, um, you know, there, there are certainly possibilities that uh, material weaknesses could exist that we did not identify. And, and I think it is important, obviously, to note as well, um, of all of these programs, you know, we've tested two and we'll test three. So there's, there's quite a bit of programs, obviously, that weren't subject to our audit as well. Uh, yeah, I, is there an audit procedure that would give an assurance for material issues? Not that I'm aware, Jody. It would be a upon procedures. Yeah, it would be a separate procedure. I mean, you know, we could come in and do um, audit of the effectiveness of your controls. So the audit we do does not give an opinion on the effectiveness of the controls, but there is such a thing where um, a separate engagement, we could come in and audit the effectiveness of the controls. And I, I'm not really sure how um, that level of opinion, if they would say what kind of assurance they would give over um, material weaknesses not identified. I'm not sure. I have never done one personally. I know we do them as a, as a firm, but, mm -hmm. but I do know they will give an opinion on the effectiveness of the controls. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason I'm asking, I guess, is that it just looks like we failed to do something. If this is an ordinary uh, accounting process, I can you can understand that, but a layperson is not going to. And uh, I guess I was uh, wondering if if you didn't evaluate um, our position for material weaknesses, that's one thing. You can just say we don't we don't evaluate that. But if we're saying we evaluated it, but we we can't assure that you don't have any that sounds like we stopped short of doing a good audit. Now, help me understand that a little bit better, will you? Yeah, I, I, I do think it's important to note that um, we do have a requirement to communicate anything we do come across. So I think that's kind of where this is focusing, that's saying as part of our procedures that we're required to do, if we did come across a either a deficiency in internal controls or a material weakness, deficiency being much smaller, material weakness being much more significant, we are required to report them. So we would, you know, come and say, you know, you do have a material weakness over your accounts payable process. You don't have an appropriate control for who's approving it. Uh, and that needs to be corrected. So we do still come with those, but we don't give a, a, an opinion on the overall control structure uh, because there's pieces that, that we just don't, simply aren't required to test unless we do that additional kind of uh, uh, audit, if you will, the, the effectiveness piece. It just has to do with the level of assurance that we are giving on the controls over compliance. Mm -hmm. Right, I understand that and I appreciate the explanation. I guess I'd feel more comfortable if you said something like, we did not note any material weaknesses to the extent that we had, you know, rather say- well, I think it, the letter does say that, but then yeah. it also goes on to say, but, but material weaknesses could exist that we did not identify, but it does say that in the testing we did do, we did not note anything. Mm -hmm. So the areas we did touch, we did not find any control deficiencies. And that's we didn't. The, the first bullet point here, um, that's what that'll touch on when, when that report comes out, no deficiencies noted that we considered to be material weaknesses. Thank you. Uh, this is just that, that summary again. Um, so once we'll, we'll test that her funds as soon as that compliance supplement comes out, uh, we've kind of brought that as far forward as we can at this point, and we'll just wait for uh, the Department of Education at this point. And most of those funds, we, we do analyze them year over year just to see uh, where the funding sources are. Most of those have been pretty consistent the last few years, obviously the big change being the HERF funds. Uh, the last piece I'll touch on is upcoming GASB standards. Uh, the big change coming up is going to be with leases. So you may have heard it's it's in both the FASB, the, the commercial world, as well as the government world. Um, the changing of accounting for how we're going to do leases 
Leases right now are just disclosed. If I enter a 10 year lease of million dollar payments, they're just disclosed in the footnotes of the financials. There's no impact on the financials themselves for the most part. Uh, that is going to change. So operating leases, ones that historically have just been disclosed are now gonna be put onto the balance sheet. So we will see a significant increase. So it will increase debt because those are contractual obligations that we have to pay. And the offset will be an increase to assets, the right to use those assets in the future. So it's not gonna influence from a profit and loss standpoint and net income standpoint, very, very minimal impact, but we are going to see a pretty significant increase in both assets and liabilities, uh, long-term debt, if you will, uh, because those are gonna be put onto the balance sheet. So any of these significant dollar amount leases um, could have a substantial impact to your capital assets as well as your uh, long-term debt. And that will go into effect beginning with uh, fiscal years beginning after June 15th, 2021. So for NIC, it would be fiscal year 22. So we won't see it next year, we'll see it the following year. And just as I touch on that, I'll just uh, bring up the draft one more time here. We do disclose leases. They are relatively uh, minimal for the college. I do have some governments I've seen that have pretty extensive, pretty significant leases. The college itself, it is relatively small. It's gonna be the lease obligation here in future payments. So if I were to implement uh, this new standard right now, uh, there would be some present valuing of, of this 821,000 that would happen. So there might be 700,000 of debt that would appear on the financials as well as an offsetting asset, a right to use these assets. So that's just something to keep in mind. We like to bring it up now so it's not shocking uh, two years from now. And that's gonna be universal across all governments, across all uh, for-profit entity entities as well. So it is gonna have a, a pretty significant impact overall. And unless there's any other questions, that uh, covers most of what we we're going to talk about. I, I do want to touch on, uh, just before we close out, and, and echo what Jody uh, has said of, you know, audits are hard. They, they take a lot of work, um, a lot of time, and, and Sarah and Chris's team have to do the audit, but still do their day jobs. Um, and that's, I know, an incredible challenge in the best of times. And this year they really went above and beyond to get us everything we needed um, to really help get work through the audit in a, in a tough environment, um, going the remote where I can't just walk down to their office and ask some questions and they hand me a document. It's, it's much more um, time consuming than that. So I, always, I do always like to point out, we, we started this audit in 2015. Uh, so this is um, what's going on six years now of uh, that we've performed this audit. Uh, when we got here, a lot of the discussion was best practices. What are the best practices? Uh, we have the advantage of seeing, you know, numerous colleges, universities, uh, institutions in the educational world and how they do things and what those best practices look like from a control standpoint, from a process standpoint. And I, I think we've really hit the point where this, you know, NIC is, is the best practice. Uh, we really see um, some, some pretty amazing changes over the last six years, really kind of dialing in all the financials, the numbers, um, and we've been really impressed with, with this team as a whole. So we want to say thank you to them. All right. Um, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Oh, you bet. Go ahead, Ken, please. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to accept the fiscal year 2020 audit as presented. Is there a second to that motion? I would second that motion and ask for discussion. Certainly. We have a second. Uh, let's open it up for discussion. And Christy, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Um, just a couple of quick, well, I'm gonna try to just ask one question and I can always call Chris later in the interest of time. Um, Chris, first of all, what a nice thing that you said, Barry, about um, and I see, and the example that they set, and they do such a great job. And thank you to everyone for a wonderful audit. Um, when you get finding no findings, that's really a cause for celebration. So great work. Um, Chris, on page 71, the very last page, 
when we're looking at the assessed property taxes since 2010, do you know what I'm looking at? I'm going to page 71 at this time. Okay. In the past nine years, our, um, we've increased our levy by about a little over $3 million. And um, what I, I want you to clarify for everyone listening tonight, I believe that I understand it, but I want you to clarify it, that we're a little over $15 million right now, which is our actual amount that's levied. We do increase property taxes. We are not levying on our net position of 90 million, a little over 90 million. Can you talk about that? I believe I understand the question, uh, Trustee Wood, and, and I, I just want to share, we're, we, um, we're, we're levying based off of the, of the Kootenai County values within, within our county. That's what we levy against. Um, and so you'll also notice on that, that page as the, the levy value has changed, the tax levy value has changed, a big portion of that change is the increase in values for properties across Kootenai County. And okay. I, am I covering your question? I want to make sure I'm addressing that. You are. Thank you. That was it. Are there any other questions or any more discussions for Chris Thank or uh, Julie or a Barry? discussion item. Please go ahead, Greg. Uh, I noticed the leases. There's a big difference through the years. Uh, could someone just speak on that and the cost savings uh, upcoming? For the future future minimum payments. That, yeah. Yeah. So, Trustee McKenzie, there's there's a lot of pieces that go into that, but part of that has been um, the college has actually reduced uh, the the projected leases into the future based on some changes that we've made um, operationally. And so some of the things that have been included in that in the past, um, we actually are not renewing some of our, our leases. Um, and so that's that's the big driver there. Uh, Barry, do you wanna share anything different than that? Yeah, I would just echo that. Uh, that's gonna be based on actual signed contractual lease payments. So if, if you know, in our case, um, after 2022, it drops off significantly, that's gonna be, you know, one specific lease ended in 2022. Um, and at this point hasn't been renewed, maybe renewed into the future, but that's why that's gonna decrease pretty significantly. If you give me um, about 10 seconds here, I can probably tell you what particular lease that is. So just real quickly, a couple of those are um, the outreach centers. So the outreach centers, um, those leases are, are coming to a close. We're not renewing uh, Bonners Ferry and Silver Valley, but the Sandpoint Center lease, um, I believe is, is a big part of that change is it goes through 2022, I believe on that lease. As soon as this opens, I can tell you if that's true. We also have leased copiers for the entire college. And so that's another lease that is a large lease. That's an operating lease that um, at this point um, expires. And we have not at this point renegotiated <clears throat> a lease for that. And you're exactly right, Chris. Uh, the Standpoint Center is the big one there, uh, about 132,000 a year. And that one falls off at the end of 2022. So that was the big change there. The Sandpoint Campus? Outreach Center. Sandpoint Outreach Center. So that's that's a leased facility uh, as well. Is did I miss that discussion where that that would be our third outreach center that would be closed and no, you haven't, missed, you haven't missed anything. We're not closing the center. We just have a lease that that would expire at 2022. And so, as part of our normal course of operation, we would be looking at at renewing that lease or finding another property in the future potentially for that space. And so at this point, that lease has a life expectancy. Okay. So I heard, okay. And I believe that the arrow lease is in there too, correct? Correct. Yep, that's one more year at about 88,000. Thank you. Greg, does that satisfy you or do you have anything else? 
I'm satisfied. Thank you, everyone. All right. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? If not, I, I would like to thank Barry and Jody for the presentation tonight and the uh, fine work that they did. Um, I'm thinking we've got the two motions, we had the discussion. I believe we need to take a vote. Is that correct at this time? Yes, we need a vote. Yep. So if I may, everyone that wants to vote yay to accept the audit as presented, uh, please say so now. Yes. Yay. Yay. Uh, any opposed? All right, let the record show that we've accepted the audit on a five to zero vote. Thank you very much, everyone, on that. Uh, Chair Banducci? Yes, sir. Uh, if I may, I just would also like to, to share, um, my name gets mentioned a lot and I get a lot of credit, but I would just like to share, there's a huge team in the Office of Finance and Business. And I think especially with our new trustees, I'd like to just share a couple of names. But oh, Sarah Garcia you. is our controller um, and has done a phenomenal job um, for a number of years with the college. But Sandra Jaco is our assistant controller. And we also have... Josh Gittle and Jess Grantham as senior accountants um, in, in our team. And I'd just like to share, there's a whole team that does this work and, and I appreciate um, the thanks that's given, but I'd like to just give praise to those that, that really did the work. So thank you for that. Fully agree. Thank you, Chris. Well done. Yeah, it's good to acknowledge the fine work that your team is doing. So thank you for taking a moment to do that, Chris, and acknowledging them. Uh, anything else from, from anyone? on this subject. All right. All right, thank you. Thank you guys, thank you. appreciate it very much. We'll move on to tab four. That'll be uh, Beth Ann and Head Start. Beth Ann, are you ready? I am ready, thank you so much. So Please Chair share Banducci that. and board members, PC, and the colleagues and guests that are here tonight, Thank you so much for allowing me to come forward with our first reading of tab four, which is the North Idaho College Head Start Policy Council bylaws, and also our plan for a self-assessment process for this year. I would just like to say North Idaho College Head Start is a school readiness program that provides education and support for young children and families. And we serve uh, we're funded and enrolled for 299 children across all five northern counties in nine specific sites. And starting with um, our policy council bylaws, our policy council is comprised of parents and community representatives that are interested in governing our program. And these representatives are all elected, such as yourselves, and the, the pattern by which they're elected is in these policy council bylaws. There are nine articles. So the name is the first article, which is North Idaho College Head Start Policy Council. And the um, other articles are the purpose and function, the membership and meeting makeup, the officers and delegates, all of the committee makeup, uh, the conflict of interest statement, a grievance procedure, an impasse policy, which is actually the impasse policy in case there's ever an impasse between the policy council and the governing board, and also any amendments. Um, there were very, very few uh, suggested changes by our policy council this year, and the only suggested changes were based on uh, numbers of parent representatives and numbers of community representatives. So our numbers of parent representatives are based on uh, the number of children in each center. And so looking at that um, representation, our policy council group really felt like there was a bit more of a heavy hand on the urban centers being able to have several more votes than any of our um, our rural sites especially. So we have um, centers that have anywhere from one classroom to, to up to five classrooms. And this would take us, um, our policy council with what was currently 16 total parent reps down to 11 total with uh, slightly less representation for those larger centers. So 
like the largest center would go down from four representatives to two, for an example. So our reps would go, parent reps would go from, from 16 to 11. And then there was never a, an actual amount of representatives that could represent the communities. So they would like to add up to five individuals could actually be community representatives. And that would give us our guaranteed at least 51% um, parent representatives, which is a, is a program performance standard that's been legislated. So um, those are the only two changes. It would change us from a potential of 31 on our policy council to a potential of 16. And it would also limit the number of community representatives that could be invited and elected to be on the policy council. Um, Chair Banducci, do you want me to pause for questions and then and then move on to our uh, self-assessment? That would, would be fine, Beth Ann. What, what, what is your preference? Does that work for you? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, at this time, for this part that Beth Ann has presented, do we have any questions or comments? Uh, hearing none, Beth Ann, why don't you proceed, please? All right, thank you so much. So the other piece of in in our um, in our tab is every year based on the both the Head Start program performance standards and the Head Start Act, which are legislatively um, mandated, we are to have a self assessment process. So every um, cycle of five years, and we're in our first year of our five year grant cycle, we are monitored by the federal government. And um, besides that, we also monitor ourselves for quality and um, for any kind of an improvement and also whether or not we're meeting the goals that we set forward in our first in our five year cycle. So our self assessment um, process this year being in the first year of our five year grant cycle, we would like to propose using the um, what the federal monitors will be using with us in either our first or second year of our, of our five-year goals. So it's called the FY 2021 Focus Area 1 Monitoring Protocol, and it is very comprehensive. It just takes an approach to looking at all of the components of our program and, and having us explain our approach and our methodology, and also um, just show how we're meeting all the federal regulations. We'd like to use that as a, as a, a basis. We may not be getting that, um, that review in our first year because the other programs that are getting a review this year have already received their letters. So we're thinking that we're not going to receive this first focus area one review until next year, but we're prepared anyway, and this will prepare us even more by going through this as a group. Um, we're proposing that we use both our staff and our administrative team, our parents, including policy council members and community representatives that would like to be part of our self-assessment process. It, it also includes a yearly parent survey and staff surveys of training needs and satisfaction, and also a, a polling of our community on different important um, measures of, of how they feel that we're doing. So what, what we would just propose is that um, Policy Council went ahead and approved this, and um, it would just be a first, first reading of us asking for your approval to also use this process for this year's self-assessment, which then culminates into a program improvement plan. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Please go ahead, Ken. Beth Ann, do you need uh, our approval to use this process? I mean, it sounds like it's just adopting a method of self-evaluation. Why? Why does the board need to approve that? Why isn't that just part of your ongoing um, internal management? 
uh, Chair Banducci and, and um, Board Member uh, Ken, the, this is actually legislatively mandated that, that the Policy Council and the Governing Board approve our self-assessment process yearly. So um, it's, it's just a manner of coming up with the, the whole plan and making sure that it's approved by both governing boards. You're going to come back with a, a second reading on this, I take it? Uh, yes. Yeah, it, it's not for action tonight. It's for information on as a first reading. Are there any other questions or comments or Beth Ann, do you have anything else to add? I do not. All right. Hearing no questions or additional comment, Beth Ann, thank you very much for the presentation. We'll look forward to hearing the second reading at the next board meeting. Thank you. You bet, take care. At this time, uh, we'll spin back around to Chris Martin. Uh, we'll be referencing tab five regarding the Meyer Health and Sciences Building Expansion Project. Uh, Chris, uh, if you're ready, go ahead and start. Chair Banducci, members of the board, this is uh, brought to you this evening as an information item, uh, just to, to kind of reset the playing field. Um, a little background, uh, this, call, this project has been on the books for, for quite a while, and we've been working <laughs> diligently towards this project. And in April, we came to the board and asked for for a pause on this project due to COVID-19 and the uncertainty of the pandemic. And so this project was essentially put on, on hold um, as we, we walked through what this fiscal year would look like, what the state appropriations would be, how enrollment um, was. And with the understanding with the board, we'd bring this project back uh, this fall and, and ask for authorization to move it to bid. And so this is the Meyer Health Science Expansion Project. Uh, this project is, is really driven around meeting the needs of our health professions and nursing programs and expanding our capacity for our sciences, which are all prerequisites for our health professions and nursing programs. And so that's the basis of this, pro this project. Um, we are seeking board approval um, this fall to, to go out to bid and take this project to bid in the first quarter of 2021. And so wanted to bring this forward tonight as an information item and, and really giving the board a chance to ask any questions. And so, uh, Trustee ba ba uh, Chair Banducci, I'll turn this over to you and the trustees if there are other questions or if I can provide more information. Well, Chris, um, thank you for that. Uh, let me open it up to the other trustees for, for questions. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Ken Howard. Um, Please go ahead, sir. It's on my understanding that we've got a workshop being scheduled uh, right around the 1st of December where we're gonna go into as much detail as we des desire to familiarize ourselves, re-familiarize yourselves in my case, but with the new trustees, familiarize themselves to the extent that they are comfortable with it. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering whether there's really much more to do tonight other than get prepared for the asking questions. Trustee Howard, thank you for that reminder. I appreciate that you are correct. We are working to schedule um, a workshop so that we can fully get into the details of this. Um, the only thing I would I would just add to this is a point of reference that um, this project is anticipated to be funding using the board's capital reserve fund. Um, and in, in the tab, I provided some details there. There is more than adequate funds in that capital reserve to, to fully pay for this expansion. That's the only other piece I, I probably should add in this conversation. Um, Mr. Chair, I have a question. Hello, I have a question, Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Um, I was having a problem with the mute button myself. <laughs> sorry. Chris, it, I, I think this workshop will probably come sooner than later, I'm sure, um, because you're going to want to get this on the December agenda so that we can take advantage of the um, bid season in the spring, is that correct? That, that is correct. And in some of your your um, notes that you provided to the board, you suggested that it would be a good bid environment. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Uh, Chair Banducci, Trustee Wood, we, we do anticipate a very, very favorable bid environment for um, early spring. 
And so we have talked with um, both ALSC, our architect, and John Young, who is, is serves as the owner's rep for, for this particular project, and just walked through all the scenarios. And, and they also are in agreement that there are no other large projects that they're aware of that are coming forward early in 2021. And it'll be, it'll be a really favorable time for us to take this to bid um, early 2021. Okay, thank you for that. I look forward to the workshop. Uh, Mr. Is there Chair, any other questions? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, just a matter of uh, form, I guess. If we're anticipating um, making this an action item in our December um, meeting, then uh, probably everybody ought to realize that we're going to be passing on the first reading, and um, and and to the extent that it's put on the agenda, it needs to be put on as a second or as an action item. Can, Mr. Howard, Ken, would you think it appropriate to cast this, make a motion to cast this as the first reading, although we had defined it as informational, and maybe that would help us meet that requirement if we called this the first reading noticed the board workshop that we're going to have and then schedule on the uh, December meeting as a second reading. How would that sound, you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that makes much difference just so we understand that the next time we're going to have an action item and we can, I think, properly address that the next meeting that it's an action right. item without waiving the first reading. Sure. sure Legal counsel, Rick, does anybody have a problem with that? Uh, uh, Trustee Howard, thank you for bringing that up. That actually was the intention. We had originally planned to have this as an action item on this month's agenda, uh, but because of the, uh, the the new trustees, we obviously decided that it was that would be uh, fair to do. Um, it it appeared as an information item, but it was it was truly intended to be a first reading, and that's a, a mistake on the. Uh, part of uh, my preparation for, for the agenda. So my apologies for that, but that's definitely what it was intended to be followed with uh, the week, the workshop, which I don't know if Shannon, have you heard back from all trustees? I know that dates went out to all five of you. Um, I just- I heard from four, four of the trustees. Okay. Trustee- And I'm probably, oh, oh, sorry, Rick, let me interrupt you. Shannon, I can accommodate the 30th and the second, but I cannot accommodate the third. That's what I was waiting to find out. So okay. I'm the one that was remiss in responding. So I'm the last probably. But to your- And Rick, sorry for interrupting. No, that's okay. But to your question, Trustee Howard, it, it was intended to be a first reading, it wasn't labeled that way, but certainly the intent is to, to provide as much information, starting with the overview of the workshop last week, having it included as an uh, item tonight, the workshop uh, coming uh, uh, the first week in December, and then having it as an action item at the December board meeting. And from a from a process perspective, we had uh, moved into a practice uh, uh, probably two or so years ago, where we were actually um, labeling all first readings as first reading slash action should the board decide that they wanted to take action without moving to a second um, a second view at, at, a, at a second board meeting. So I, um, Megan, unless you uh, have any advice or challenge on that, I don't think there would be any problem moving this to an action item at the December meeting. Chair Banducci, President McClinton, um, I completely agree with that. From a, a legal notice perspective, uh, all, all we need to do is make sure that at the December meeting is properly noticed for action and the board can take action at that time. And, and frankly, today's agenda does identify it as a first reading. So I, I think you're also fine procedurally and, and the minutes can reflect it as such. All right, that sounds fine. Uh, is there any more uh, comment or any uh, further questions at this time? Ken, I appreciate the good points that you brought up. Thank you. Uh, Rick, is there anything else that you have to add at this time on that? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, Chris, one last opportunity for you prior to the board workshop. Anything else you'd like to add at this time? Uh, no, sir. Thank you. All right. Very good. 
it looks to me, if there's no other questions or comments on that, that it comes to, uh, to the board chair report. Um, I will keep this very short. Uh, just a couple of things real quick. Very honored to be in this position and looking forward to engaging with the, the community as a, as a partner over this next year and, and uh, just having this maximum transparency as a college as we work with the community and, and both on and off the campus that we have a free exchange of ideas and speech and, and for everyone. And uh, one last thing I'd like to note, there's a very special individual that's been a wonderful asset to the uh, college and, and a very dear friend to, to my wife and I. Uh, I wanna do a shout out for Laura Untham who's done a tremendous job running our ABE and GED programs. She is retiring. Uh, she's, again, a dear friend. She's a co-teacher with my wife uh, at uh, Peak Fitness together, and we've had the pleasure of knowing her for years. And just want to thank her for the her outstanding service and the uh, tremendous job that she's done over the years. And just let her know that she she will be missed. And so, uh, anyway, however you do it, give a, give a clap to Laura. Mm -hmm. And uh, that concludes my board chair report. I would like to see if anybody has any remarks for the good of the order, please. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, I received uh, uh, an email from Brad Murray that he asked me to read uh, to them uh, at this board meeting. And so I'd like to do that now. Um, Go ahead. Brad states, I would like to thank the NIC students, staff and faculty for these past four years while I served as a trustee. There is a wonderful climate and culture that has been established here at NIC, and I was allowed a glimpse of that through my work as trustee. I would also like to thank the president's cabinet and President McLennan for their commitment, dedication, and service they provide to this institution. Their active leadership is evident throughout campus and in the community. They have led us well in times of calm and chaos. We are in great shape, in large part due to their leadership. To my fellow board members, thank you for your service. Many people voice their concerns publicly, but are less willing to take an active role and provide the type of community service each of you have been by being a board member and then becoming a part of the solution. I have respect for each of you and wish you all the best. In closing, I want to briefly share some research by Dr. Dana Mitra from Pennsylvania State University that states, a great deal of research demonstrates the benefits of supporting public education extent far beyond each individual's academic gains. A population that is better educated has less unemployment, reduced dependence on public assistance programs and greater tax revenue. Education also plays a key role in the reduction of crime, improved public health, and a greater political and civic engagement. Investment in public education results in billions of dollars of social and economic benefits for society at large. NIC graduates provides graduates who are work ready and can immediately, can immediately add to our local economy. As long as our programs maintain current levels, NIC continues to be fiscally conservative and yet remains responsive to the needs of students, business, and industry, and our community. Keep NIC strong. Signed, Brad Murray. Mr. Chair? Yes, ma'am. And I would like to also add some comments. First of all, Ken, thank you for reading that. Brad's a class act. So is uh, Dr. Joe Dunlap. Um, I would like to thank both of them for their years of service. Um, those of us that have served a long time know that it's a, quite the commitment, but it's worth it. And I think both of them felt it was worth it. In normal circumstances, we would be in the big room on campus and we'd have a celebration and pass the torch to our new trustees. And we would thank our outgoing trustees with maybe some cake and certainly a gift. And I will follow up with the president on those ideas. Um, but most of all, we would make it clear how much they meant to us and their dedication to the college. And so I wanna be sure to say that tonight to both of them, that um, their, their efforts over the years are greatly appreciated and I wish them well. 
Um, I know that there's a lot of great things out there they'll both be doing, probably having a lot of fun. And so uh, again, just wanted to thank them for their service. All right, is there anything else anyone would like to add? I, 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 um, I would like to add just a few comments. Um, in the beginning of this meeting, I uh, congratulated uh, the new trustees and you, Todd, on your election. And I renew that congratulations. Um, you are, uh, the new trustees are ready to embark on what I have found to be an exciting journey being a part of this NIC uh, program. Um, but I also um, want to uh, say thank you and, and, uh, and um, remark on the value that was added to the trustee obligations by Brad Murray and Joe Dunlap over their tenure. They both uh, were committed to doing a strong and, and very heartfelt job for NIC, and they both showed a great love for this institution in the time and effort they, they put into their, their duties as, as trustees. So I want to thank them also, and uh, again, uh, uh, congratulate the new trustees and let them know that I think uh, a great experience lies ahead of them. Appreciate you sharing those sentiments. I think uh, the future is bright for the college and for all involved and engaged. Is there anything else that anybody else would like to add? All right, if, uh, if there's not, unless there's any other business that we need to attend to, Rick, is there anything that you know of? If not, I will uh, adjourn this meeting. Meeting adjourned.